No thanks, cares. everybody. All right, thanks, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, we're going to have a little fun with the panel today. Uh, I thought I'd start us out with a little bit of a quote. There's a famous basketball coach from UCLA whose name's John Wooden. And he's quoted as saying, if you're not making mistakes, then you probably aren't really doing anything. And I kind of thought that was relevant for our world as mobile product managers, because there's no roadmap to suggest what we're supposed to do next, right? There's no examples for all of the various scenarios we come into, right? I mean, Apple updates iOS, and then something that we have breaks. Android probably happens more frequently. We have to deal with that situation. So the best we can do is to do. And we learn by doing and learn by making mistakes. We take them in stride, and we laugh at them in hindsight, and hopefully we don't repeat the same things again. But I think we're at our best when we're sharing experiences with one another and we're learning from one another, and that's what we're going to do today. So this group of folks up here is going to share with you some of the more, or rather, less flattering moments that we've had in our career. And we're going to kind of laugh at them a little bit, talk about them, and uh, we're going to engage the audience at the end for a question and answer so that we can actually hear from you and uh, ideas that you have about things that you've experienced and uh, insights that you might want to hear from us. So with that, I told V that I was going to put her on the spot. She was going to be the one that I was going to hit up first. And so I thought I would start it out by asking V, like, let, tell us about a situation, a, a lesson you learned difficult in a difficult way that you uh, took away an insight that you could share with the team. Yeah. Um, OK. Can you all hear me? Um, I'm not used to the mic. Um, OK. So, uh, so I think one of the big lessons is um, y there's really no substitute for customer feedback. Um, a few years ago, uh, we added into, into our app the ability to scan um, grocery items. And the, the scenarios that we, we imagined were, um, as a user throws something away, um, they could just sort of scan it and add it to their shopping list, or they could search for things um, just by scanning. Um, and what we found um, in real life is, well, the things that people actually search for generally aren't scannable, you know, chicken, um, fruit. Um, and, um, and the scenario of scanning right before you throw something away sounds really cool, but, you know, thumbing it out with your, um, you know, fingers is actually a lot faster. Um, and so it, it, it didn't actually ever, um, you know, live up to the promise that, that we were hoping for. So um, a while later, we ended up cutting it, and not one user complained. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's cool. Yeah, I, I, I think I've experienced that as well, where we've, we've launched product features and we thought, oh, this is exactly what people are going to want, right? Oh, of course this is what they want. And then you get it out there and it just sort of, you know, like nothing. You don't hear anything positive, negative about it, and it shows up in the user data. I had an interesting uh, experience where earlier in my career I was working for AOL Instant Messenger, right? AIM, if anybody remembers the running man. Uh, rest in peace, rest in peace. Uh, we had this interesting phenomenon going on in, in, in AIM where we had a status message, right? Status message was, um, you know, I'm out of the office, I'm on vacation, whatever. We started seeing people update these things like 20 times a day, right? And we're thinking, what in the hell are people updating status messages 20 times a day? And we didn't read what they were updating because that's way too obvious. So, but we were seeing this in the data and I kind of called BS on the data. I was like, no way. Like, this is ridiculous, right? I don't understand why people do this. I would never do this. At the same time, there was, there was this other company coming up called Twitter. And Twitter was, we were talking to Twitter, and Twitter was like, this is the new thing. We're going to do this thing, and people are going to love it. And it, everybody's going to get a text message anytime somebody, you know, makes a trip to the restroom. And I'm thinking, this is insane. There's no way. And then Twitter started growing. And I, and, and our team got back, and we're looking at the data, and we're saying, this makes no sense. We actually didn't believe the data. And so we, I called Twitter a fluke. We passed on a partnership opportunity with Twitter to host their back end. And if anybody remembers the whale fail, we, were, we could have solved that. But we ignored Twitter. And so we, that was my embarrassing moment in hindsight is I, I, looked, and I looked back and I say, oh my god, I had no idea the data is staring me in the face. And I completely called Twitter a fluke. And now we've got you know, the president tweeting all the time. So the biggest question is, do you use Twitter now? Kind of. <laughs> I kind of do. Yeah. I, 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 tend, I do tend to, OK, so true confessions, right? I have it set up to where it'll post simultaneously to Twitter and LinkedIn. 
And I don't do Facebook for some reason. I think maybe that's more personal. But yeah, I, I use it in a little bit. It doesn't, it doesn't make you like cringe, cringe every time? Yeah, I kind of feel like I really screwed that one up because I was like, oh man, the data was right there. I can't believe it. Yeah, so lesson learned was, you know, trust the data. I don't know, have you guys ever run into a situation where you've had data staring you in the face and you just said, I can't imagine that anybody would want to do this? It must be a fluke. I mean, I think we're, um, at Providence, we're currently going through the opposite where we don't have any data. Um, <laughs> so we were a, we're part of an innovation team and we um, have built our product from a beta that sort of launched as a, a real full-fledged product, but without any of the analytics that you truly want to understand what your users are doing. Um, so we're currently going through a period of understanding what do we want to learn from our users and then going back in and actually adding that, all those key pieces back in. Um, and so right now we're kind of, we, we have account managers that are um, selling to other hospital systems, selling our apps, so we're white labeling to other hospital systems. And they want all this data and they want to understand it. And so they've been going into Google Analytics and pulling out the pieces they think they want. And we're like, no, do not look at it. We don't know if it's right. <laughs> um, so we're actually releasing on Friday a new release, hopefully, um, that includes a lot more of the analytical data that we need to understand. Nice. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to make some better decisions because we've been kind of running blind for a while and um, it feels a little scary. So we, we did that too. I mean, when I first I joined um, Microsoft to on the OneNote team a couple years ago. When I first joined, we didn't have any analytics. I mean, we knew I think we knew monthly active users, but we had really uh, low visibility into our our retention and our churn information. And it was seat of the pants kind of decisions like, okay, the best we can do is talk to customers and get a sense for what they're telling us. And even though we don't have, you know, volumes of data, that was sort of the best we could do. Um, and most of the time we guessed right. I think there were a few times we guessed wrong. I think there was one time we ran an alert. Uh, we wanted to promote collaboration. So we found out, oh yeah, if people are collaborating with their notes, um, you know, retention will be better. So we said, oh, well, what if we gave an alert every time somebody updated a, 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 a shared notebook? Yeah, that's what happened. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was real noisy. Uh, we ended up sort of, uh, we tested it, which sort of makes the end result even more embarrassing. But um, we ended up spamming our users for a period of time, and then we had to roll that back. And we're like, oh, yes, that's actually going to be kind of chatty. We don't want that. Uh, but we heard about it in, in loud voices. So yeah. I think one of the screw-ups uh, embarrassed, there's too many that I can name here in the time we have. But uh, I worked for a carrier, local carrier, um, uh, Magenta, and uh, was launching a new, <laughs> won't name names, uh, but uh, was launching a new device. <laughs> Fair. It was T-Mobile. Uh, was launching a new device, and um, there were a lot of. It was a lot of new and a lot of old in this device. What I mean by that is the operating system was uh, kind of a dinosaur at the time. Um, uh, Windows six point, I think six point five. Ooh. And it did a lot, but it didn't do a lot really well. And we had a partner, uh, HTC, that had this really awesome four-inch diagonal screen with a, this is way back when, so I'm dating myself, but Qualcomm Snapdragon processor. Um, and so uh, the, my colleagues and I looked at this device, and we looked at what we had, and we thought, well, we could launch this device pretty you know, plain and, and boring. Um, but what we wanted to do is try to turn that thing into an entertainment portal for our users. And it hadn't really been done before that way at T-Mobile. So, we partnered with uh, a number of media uh, app companies, so <laughs> Blockbuster. Uh, Netflix was doing something else with Apple at the time. They said thanks, but no thanks. We ultimately got them to uh, be on the next device preloaded. But anyway, so we had uh, Windows 6.5 um, coupled with this brand new device, which was really powerful. And we did a lot of deals with um, different uh, media companies, um, Moby TV and Blockbuster. and. Uh, uh, we rolled our own Amazon MP3 app, the T-Mobile team did, and we partnered with Amazon to do that. So all those apps on this device uh, with an older operating system that wasn't getting any love from, from Redmond kind of <laughs> really just came together and we thought, okay, we have, this, we have this tight timeline, are we gonna make it or not? So we ended up, um, we launched the device, but it had one of the higher return rates in T-Mobile's history. So. Uh, we under, under market pressure, we delayed it a few times, and ultimately said we just had to go. 
Um, that was a big failure, I think, in the, in the many millions of dollars, but more importantly, the customer trust and the sales teams in the retail, and then, of course, our partnership deals. I think that's so. a common thing, though, right? Like, there's always pressure to ship. You're working on something for such a long time. I feel like that's a universal thing where you've got so much invested in this, and yes, it, we know that there are problems. It's not perfect, but if we wait on perfection, we're never going to get it right. That seems like a common thread. Is that something that I, I feel like I've certainly experienced that multiple times? Yeah, Would market you guys pressure. Say, you know, there's plans to go, and you have to make hard calls near the end, and um, you sometimes it's a leap of faith. Other times you try to be like, all right, can we stub in the app? This is before the app store. Can we stub it in to where they fire the app up and then it downloads? So you kind of safeguard that process a little bit and update the app as it's launching and so that the user gets the new one. You know, But now that's all moot. But yeah, yeah you have to make the calls to either pull stuff off or um, say we're going to launch and there's going to be some impact here and we're going to let the, the users know. Yeah, I'd be curious to hear from you guys about how you balance that pressure too. You know, because there is a, it's a fine line and there's no cut and dry answer. Like, do we ship or do we delay and get it a little bit better? How do you guys, how do you guys handle that type of thing? And what do you, what type of, uh, what's your decision tree look like? And how, what are some examples of when you had to make a tough call one way or the other? So I think from my perspective, um, what I tend to do is I lean on my team a lot. I, I think that they are the ones that are really in the code, in the QA process day to day and they really understand all the pitfalls that are hiding behind the scenes. Um, I do remember a time, and Darren knows the story, but um, <laughs> so I had been working at Starbucks. We had relaunched the iOS and Android apps um, with the new design and totally rewrote them from scratch with an in-house team. And the launch went off pretty great. It was delayed a few times. Um, but ultimately, we got there. And it was a situation where leadership kept saying, ooh, but we'd love to have this in. It's like, great, you can have it. It's going to be another month. Um, and so we finally got there, got over the finish line. Um, and then a couple months later, we were just doing a, like a routine bug fix release. But it was one of those times where we were like, OK, we got to get it out because it was, I can't remember what it was for, but we had to get this one fix in. And so we kind of rushed it. Um, and this was when the apps were very high profile at the time because they had just released. Everything was going great. So I get a call um, very early in the morning, and it's Howard Schultz on the other end. And he was not at, a good thing. no. Usually not a good thing. The, the, <laughs> the update had come out the night before. Um, he was trying to use the pay functionality at his local Madison Park store and scan his barcode, and the app kept crashing. Um, and so what we had found out is that we had an upgrade crasher that hadn't been tested. Um, maybe had been tested, but not fully. Um, not on and not on Howard's phone. <laughs> he was the best QA. Um, <laughs> he really was. He always had that one phone with that one problem. Um, it was crazy. Uh, but anyway, so I get the call, and it's literally like the store had just opened. Like the man never sleeps. And so he was, I was like, how did you even get my phone number, number one? Um, <laughs> I found out later. It was another person on the senior leadership team who will remain nameless. Um, but we got the call that it was crashing on the pay screen. Like, can you imagine? Like, this is before we had launched mobile order and pay. So the, the biggest benefit of the app was the pay screen, like scanning that barcode. And so quickly, I like rally the troops. We get into work. We figure out what the issue is. We work like day and night for like 24 hours straight trying to get the release out and really make sure it's tested this time, <laughs> which was key. Um, and then I actually had to go to Howard's office and prove to him that the upgrade bug was fixed. Um, like imagine like tail between your legs, like, oh uh, yeah, we fixed it, I promise this time. Um, anyway, we got it fixed, but it was crazy because on, like talk about customer feedback. This was like before we had implemented up 10 of, this was before we had done a lot of like, any customer feedback. Twitter was on fire. People were pissed. They, I was like, just grab your credit Twitter, card. Twitter ended up being a thing, didn't it? It did, it did, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Big surprise. Yeah, big surprise. Um, so if we had actually looked at Twitter the night before, we probably would have realized then that the crasher bug was in there. <laughs> um, but anyway, long story short, we got it fixed. Um, but it was definitely one of those moments where it was like, can I 
can I just hide under a rock right now? Because even though like I'm not the one QAing it, I'm not the one developing it, like you are the face of the product. And so it's really important to like understand all those pieces and really get your hands dirty too, because I guarantee you, I am such a proponent of like forced upgrade now. Like put that in your code. Because then you can flip a switch and be like, guess what, users, you have to go on this new version. Um, I like so that, that insight though. Forced upgrade is the what you took away from it. Well, I was sitting here thinking the lesson learned for me was like, don't give your number to Howard Schultz, right? Like, <laughs> like whatever you do. Which is, yeah. <laughs> but I like that better. That's actually useful. Yeah. Um, so now, like every time I come to a new company, I'm like, do you have forced upgrade? If not, we're adding that first. Um, nice. So we've added it at Providence, which is, it, it has saved us a couple of times where we've been like, oh shoot, we really have like a bug or a version we wanted to switch over our whole back end. And so everyone really did need to update. Do you, do you, and is the force upgrade happen every single upgrade or do you just flip no. the switch and you say this just is a, a server flag upgrade. you can server yeah, flag? switch and then we have nice. language in there that you can turn on. Um, it's really, really useful. And mm -hmm. we've actually used the upgrade um, tools in Aptenev as well um, to sort of softly do that. And then we usually do a forced upgrade after that. Yeah, so I think that's I think that's good advice. Path. We've had to do that before uh, at a previous role, and I, it's it helped. Yeah, it helped. Yeah, for sure. One of the things that I think is interesting too is um, we've sort of all been around before mobile BM, <laughs> bad acronym. Um, so before mobile, but now we've been living this sort of mobile centric world, um, and it's different. Right? I mean, mobile is fundamentally different than when we were building for web and desktop apps and everything. Um, I'm curious to get perspective from you guys on what you've learned from mobile. Like, what are the things now in a mobile-centric, mobile-first world that are different? What's more important about our job as product managers, product designers in a mobile-first world? Move very, very fast. Yeah because that's what customers are expecting. And so um, when I go into any, any sort of uh, new role, I assess you know, how often are we pushing a, a new app out to market. And if that cadence is you know, two months or three months, that's just way too long in my view. Um, yeah, I would add um, to that, um, with less screen real estate, the, the sort of harder um, you have to look at your priorities and get really crisp around that. Uh, there's a quote that I've heard that I love. Um, it goes, uh, your strategy is fought on the battlefield of UX. Um, and I think that's especially true um, as it relates to mobile, um, where you really kind of have to get really crisp about what's important, what's not important, um, you know, and how much of this tiny space is it, is it um, worth you know, for every given um, thing you're trying to do. I think we, we've probably all tried to fit the desktop experience into mobile screen at some point, show of hands. Anybody do that and make that mistake, right? Like, don't do that. If you've not done that, don't do that. that that's, that's, yes. Definitely a, 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 new, a new UI is required and new folk and more focus, right? Yeah. I think for us too, um, it's really important, like when we first relaunched the Starbucks apps, um, we had really done an iOS centric design and so we basically, and I, I see this happen everywhere, is iOS gets slammed into Android. The user experience is very different. Um, users use their phones very differently on the two platforms. And we heard from customers immediately, like, what are you doing? Like, and people started just dropping the app, to be honest. Our numbers on Android kind of tanked. Um, and so we went back and had to redesign the whole app with material design in mind. and. It totally changed. I mean, it, it really did change, and you, customers were like, wow, this is great. Um, but it's gone through a lot of evolution to try and get back to that point. Still, at Providence, you know, we are, today I, you know, went through a design review, and all the, app, all the, all the comps were for iOS, and I was like, where's the Android comps? You know, like, the interaction is fundamentally different. And I think we've all kind of made that mistake of assuming that they're going to be the same, and users are going to use their phones the same. Um, but understanding the different platforms is really key. And then I think on top of that, understanding, really digging into usability and understanding how users use those platforms differently. Um, and the demographics. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> I think, no, I, I think it's a really good point, though. We did it when I worked at uh, Glimpse, it was a company I was at just prior to Microsoft. We did the same thing. We spent a lot of time on a redesign. And we felt it was really good, and we felt like it was kind of universal. We were sort of splitting the difference between iPhone and Android a little bit. 
whoa, what a bad mistake, right? Like we, we, the iPhone users got mad, um, not as mad as the Android users because we were skewing in that direction, like what you said. And we felt like, okay, this will, the, this metaphor, this navigation metaphor will carry over. And it didn't. It just, they fundamentally use it different. And then you've got the fragmentation problem with Android. So you've got some people on a Samsung and some people on an LG device. So you really do have to think about it differently. That was a, that's a lesson I've learned the hard way as well. Yeah. Design matters. Design matters. Yeah. And I think also, also navigation really matters. Um, you know, like you're trying to slam a hamburger basement into a design that doesn't work. Does everyone know what a hamburger basement is? The three little lines. Do everybody know the hamburger menu, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so trying to like slam that into a design that really doesn't work. And my kind of key is like expose those things that a user, like look at your analytics, see what users are using, do your usability, and understand, bring to the front those key pieces that the user wants the most. Um, because the other stuff can be hidden and people will people will discover it. Like, it's mobile and people are willing to play around. I mean, Snapchat, give me a break. Like, you have to I also didn't think have Snapchat was going to be a thing for what it's worth. I <laughs> didn't get um, that. I did give it to my five-year-old. Like, I handed her my app and she figured it out very quickly. Um, I can still not figure it out. But, um, <laughs> you know, I think that's really key, too, is understanding the navigation model um, is really different on mobile as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think you, you touched on something there a minute ago about, you know, looking at your analytics and see what your users are doing. That was something else I, I sort of learned the hard way is um, people will use your product in ways you don't think. Um, this was a very strange lesson I had to learn uh, when I was at Glimpse. So for those that don't know, Glimpse is a, a, lo a temporary location sharing application allows you to send a link to somebody and they can see you on a map in real time so and the link has a time to live so it you know I'll send any one of you as a glimpse or maybe on Twitter and people can see me where I am and then for 20 minutes or whatever I said and then it blows up so what was interesting was we we were going along and our analytics didn't look right because it looked like wow people are sending these glimpses out and some of them are getting viewed and some of them are not um, and then we started seeing that people would view the glimpse. Uh, it, let's say I send a glimpse to my wife every day when I go home for, from work, right? She knows I'm in, the, in traffic. She knows if I'm stuck. She knows what time I'm coming home. But after a while, we were seeing patterns where people that would receive a glimpse would look at it for a couple, like the first couple of times, and then stop looking at it. And we thought something was broken, and we kept trying to figure it out. And we were you know, wringing our hands over the fact that nobody likes our product, and it sucks, and all this stuff. And then when we started to dig in a little bit, when we talked to users and sort of dug into exactly what they were doing, what we found out was like just getting the just getting the link was almost a security enough to know something was happening. For example, like with my wife, she was actually one of the people that stopped looking at my glimpse when I sent it. But you know, and the reason was she was like, "Hey, all I need to know is you're on your way. If, like if you're not here after a certain time, I'm going to click that link." But you're almost always here when I expect you. just tweet that now. I just tweet it now. Yeah. <laughs> I get it out. I go, I go broad. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, for, for me, the, the analytics uh, and, and how customers use the app, uh, I've run into that a number of times. One was with a, a voice assistant called Dragon Mobile Assistant. And that was one of my products uh, I worked uh, on at Nuance Communications. So the data was showing us that the, the number of speech transactions per customer was actually lower than another product we, we were managing. My team was managing S Voice, mm -hmm. and that's Samsung's you know speech voice assistant. And we, we were scratching our heads as to why. And um, the the Dragon Mobile Assistant interface had kind of a persona floating at the top and the mic at the bottom. You might know where this is going. Oh yeah. And so we were we wired up Localytics um, to have a new event. I said, are people pressing that top person? Why is this, are they interacting with it in a way that we're not expecting? And sure enough, we found about 45% of new users were pressing on the top persona floaty character because it was drawing oh, their yeah. eye to it to like, you know, interact in speech and engage. So we ultimately made the call to simplify that design entirely, took the persona and kind of rolled it into the mic or behind it, yeah. and the, the speech transactions went up drastically once we did that. So do you find, you know, there's always this sort of interesting debate around allow users to discover whatever feature it is in whatever way they will, meaning it could be multiple ways to get to, let's say, the microphone that you were talking about. Do you guys find that 
Where do you fall on that argument? Like, is it okay to let people discover, like to have multiple ways to accomplish the same thing in an app, or do you try to keep it on rails? Where do you fall on that, just opinion-wise? Dealing with this right now with a different way to um, input information into the Smartsheet app and the mobile app right now. Yeah. Um, and so we found that about half of the users prefer to edit it right in the, the grid, as we call it. Mm. And about half of the users prefer to open up kind of a form with the... Yeah, so what the, do you do with rest. that? 50-50, um, that's like a coin flip. It, it about is, but I think we need to solve for both in a, in a very uh, efficient way and intuitive way for the users and allow them to choose and empower them. So yeah. we're working on that right now. Don't yeah. have an answer, but yeah. Yeah, uh, what I would say to that is, I think this is where A-B testing comes into play. So, oh yeah, good point. Um, so you can really start understanding um, what what is most interesting for people um, and when and what's the right sort of weight of it, if you will. Um, and so I think I think getting crisp about um, you know what are your hypotheses are and and putting forward variants so that you can mm. you can learn I think is is really important and I think um, sort of pivoting um, so that you're really leaning forward on on learning and optimizing for learning. Um, and you know, you asked a question earlier too about um, you know, how do you know when to release versus not? Should you wait, should you make it better and then release? Yeah. Um, I, think, uh, I think I would, I would sort of say the same thing. Like I think it's all about figuring out what you can learn. So if you can, if you can get something, maybe that's not magical, but it's still valid from the perspective of learning something new um, I like that. Then, yeah. then go for it, um, and learn what you can learn, and then iterate. I think I, I think you nailed it on that. I, that's actually one lesson I've learned too. Um, I can't think of how I learned it the hard way, but I learned it over time. Which is, you know, we should, as a team and as product managers, my metric is optimize for speed of learning. Um, hopefully, minimize for embarrassment. Like that's that's good too. But optimize for speed of learning. Like, how fast can I learn something? And 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 really forcing yourself to be hypothesis driven. You use that term, being hypothesis driven. I love that. Yeah. Um, and that that's that's one of the guiding principles I've taken away from my experience. Yeah. yeah. I think for for me, the biggest problem that I've had with that is getting leadership on board. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, getting them convinced that you can really do a pure MVP Wait. first and then iterate on that MVP seems to be the hardest thing to kind of get through to people um, until you get to that point where you are moving quickly. So when you can like release really quickly and really break your features up into something that's smaller and more consumable, then that's great. But to get leadership kind of over that hump of, but we can't release without X, Y, and Z, um, it's like, well, you, actually you can. And um, that's kind of been the biggest lesson as a product manager is just helping um, kind of teach and inform how that can happen and really working with your team to understand how you can break those pieces up. I think you touch on something that's really good, which I think is also a universal challenge. Uh, I, I've certainly experienced it. What do you do when you have a CEO or a member of leadership team that is really driving for something that the customers aren't asking for, or that there's just no data to suggest that it's meaningful for customers? Like, how do you deal with that? I, I, just, I try to tease out of them and understand the context. Is it a pet project? Is it something they heard in the hallway? Is it a, um, you know, uh, something that uh, their daughter said to them in the car earlier? You know, feedback. That, that's amazing how often that's the case, right? It does. <laughs> and so you have to parse through where they're coming from, why, you know, how they got that idea, the seed of the idea in their head. Mm -hmm. And to also what I do is uh, remind them of the massive backlog of root <laughs> Priority zero things we've got to do. So how, where does this fall into like if doing A and B? Oh yeah, well it was just a suggestion. When it's like you know it's just an idea. When they say that, that's nice. just that's, it takes up a lot of time to answer those sort of. So could, could I could I interpret that to say that you're calling their bluff, like in a way like, hey, would you rather fix I, this? Crash I try issue? not to. It's 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 really about sorting out in their mind where it fits uh, for them yeah. and let them empower them to make that decision relative to the other stuff we got going on. Okay, I would just add, um, sort of, in in terms of understanding the request, um, figure out what's driving the request. And I think, I think most often, you know, maybe the specific request isn't something that is in line with, with kind of the roadmap already. But if you kind of work backwards to the root of, of kind of the motivation behind it, you'll probably find something that is, um, and then and then sort of work to, to um, to either say, hey. 
you know what, that's actually the same idea that we've got coming in a month, or, or, um, or maybe adjust your plans to sort of incorporate this idea and kind of um, uh, bring it, I, I, I generally don't think there's any new ideas. Like, if there's, they're all there in your backlog somewhere. Um, Orthogonal so, sometimes, but uh, yeah, like uh, part of it or more than you're doing or whatever. Yeah, right? and so there's, you know, there's probably a way to massage it into something that's kind of already on plan or, you know, you need to yeah. change your plans. I think that's a good point, too, is um, one of the things that saved my life a number of times is adopting agile approach to development where you can actually say, look, this isn't me making the decision of whether to do this or not now. We have a plan of record that we adhere to, and the plan of record is the authority. So great idea. Yes, we're going to do this. We're just not going to do it right now. We're going to put it in the queue. We're going to get to it maybe in the next sprint. The good news is if, you're, if your sprints are coming up in one or two week or even three week cycles, it's not that far away for, for, to give somebody a date. So. Or do you know what we do to, if, if it really comes up and it's something we need to vet out and prioritize? We validate that with user research. We run there some surveys and before, you know, as, as a concept. Mm -hmm. And if it comes back as a high runner, we'll, we'll pay more attention to it. So. Yeah, I like that. We actually, um, so we used Aptenev at Providence. Um, we implemented a series of surveys uh, right when, when I kind of came on board and um, to try and understand what our users actually wanted. And it's drastic, <laughs> Rebecca's laughing, she's on my team. Um, it's drastically <laughs> changed our roadmap because um, the one thing, so our, our app is a pregnancy and postnatal app for moms. So it's got all the baby trackers, all the pregnancy information you want, a ton of content about pedi pediatrics and your kids. Um, and it connects to your um, medical record. So the biggest thing users want is to be able to message their doctor and have them message them back in the app. And that can happen via my chart pretty easily. Um, and that was not on our roadmap. I mean, it was, but like, we're talking like end of next year, not even end of this year. Um, so our roadmap's changed now, and we will be implementing that in the second half of this year. So we basically said, well, this is what our customers, I mean, resoundingly, it was like 80% of survey respondents said, this is what we wow. want. Um, and so it was really cool to see how it influenced it. I was gonna t say something really quick about the leadership thing though. Oh yeah, um, sure. So my favorite, first of all, I love hack days. Like I think they're great. Um, Cause I love to see what the teams come up with. Um, but my favorite thing is like when leadership, after a hack day, they see all the ideas and they're like, well, so that, that code works, right? Like we could roll that out right now. Ship it, <laughs> baby, like, ship it. We're not shipping that. Totally. We've had that before. Or I, I've had twice where rogue developers like literally snuck something to the app where I was like, mm, well, you know It'd what? It'd be a good movie. It's good, right? Yeah, it would rogue be a good developers. movie. Yeah, we should film We had it. a talk before his about Easter eggs. I freaking love Easter eggs. Oh, me too. Yeah, like I think that they should be encouraged. Uh, I live. If other people are aware they're going out. Um, <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> I was a developer for a while, way back in the day, for CheapTickets.com, and I had a situation where I was testing new um, cr real-time credit card processing. That was how, that's how far away that was. And fraud detection, so I was rolling out the code. And I pushed out the code with uh, emoticons at that point, or oh, you know, smiley faces. Uh, so if it passed the credit card authorization, it had a smiley face um, for the call center reps, so they could see it as they're working with the customer. Um, or a frowny face or a red face if it was fraud detection. But I forgot to include, as part of my test harness, um, any text to go along with that. So 800 <laughs> call center reps over five call centers, um, as soon as we pushed out the code, we're seeing just a smiley face, a frowny face, or a red face, and didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That was a whoops. How That's, quickly did that get rolled That was a nice Easter egg. <laughs> yeah, pretty quickly. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, I'm doing a quick time check. I said I would open it up for questions. Uh, we have a few, a little bit of time left. Um, I'll open it up to you guys. Any questions from the group? Any, any interesting challenges you want insight on? Two questions, two questions. All right. Yeah. Okay, so the question was, has there ever been a time where you've gone through the process of development, you figure out you royally screwed up and they're sort of past the point of no return? And, and that probably yes, I think. But then the question is, then what do you do about it, right? Um, I'm punting on that one. Roll forward. Yeah, roll, roll forward. forward. I think that's the biggest thing I've had to sort of teach leadership as well is, like with mobile apps, there's not a real rollback, right? Like your back end can... Yeah kind of pick up some of the slack depending on how you've developed it, but 
Um, it's a roll forward plan. That's why my forced upgrade is key, guys. Um, yeah, that's a good point. But it ties right into that. You know, it depends on if it hit production, though. Right? That's like, true, yeah. If it never goes out, then... Then you're fine. Um, I've, I've been in the situation, though, where I have... Um, it's been the point of no return, and it might not be because of functionally it's not working. It might be, oh, crap, this is really... Like, users are going to hate this. Um, and it's been to the point where you're so far in that development cycle that we've finished it out. Um, I don't think I'd do that now. If I was in the same situation, mm -hmm. I think I would maybe make a different decision. Because I would mm -hmm. want those that time to actually focus on something that was valuable. Um, I think that takes, you have to experience that to learn that lesson, yeah. don't you? Yeah, I, have a, I was thinking um, kind of along those same lines, roll forward, but then iterate fast. Mm -hmm. Like, what can we do quickly to get beyond this? Because it's going to suck for about a week or two, right? So how, what do we do to minimize that pain point, that pain period? Anything else? All right. Sounds good. Thanks, everybody.